Hi everybody. We've got a herd of impala and we've got a wildebeest with them and they're just right up by the camp. There's the wildebeest following them. I don't know if he's part of Billy's herd. I would imagine not. Welcome to Friday Afternoon Drive. Hey, hey, it's Friday. <laughs> Friday at the end of July. In fact, it's the last Friday of July. It's rather strange to think of. Let's see, these impala might... Oh, they're turning around. They might see if they might, they're going to, which means that the whole herd might come past this little gap. So we just have the camera. Oh, never mind. If I can see him. Get stung by a bee or something on your cheek. <laughs> okay, I want to just move forward a little bit. Okay, maybe the rest of the herd is going to come by. But they might have seen me playing with the camera, so they might not. I think they're going to sort of come running through this gap. Hardware failure and FC took you away from me. Welcome back everybody. This is Tony Bush. This is the last couple of days of live drives of Tony Bush. And I suppose ultimately what we want to do is we want to sort of wrap things up. We want to we want to visit some of the old things and catch up with some of the characters that we've been seeing. I hope we can do that. And believe it or not, this very herd of Impala that we've been looking at, that got spooked when we were starting, they've all come out here, I can see there's 
one wildebeest has moved up here as well. There's some zebra too. And I'm hoping we can just spend a bit of time with them. We want to go and look for elephants, and we've got a couple of male lions that are relatively close to camp on the other side of the river. Track them to a particular spot today, but no further than that. And uh, I'm going to wait until it cools down, and we'll head back that way when we say goodbye. So that maybe by the time we say goodbye, we're at them. Funny that somebody said that that little boy. He who calls and does not get answered. Funny how they mentioned that he'll be back to say goodbye. And he is, I think. Well, I'm going to have to turn. Here's that wildebeest. Um, he's, a, he's a marine corporal, this wildebeest. He's on loan from a base over on Hawaii. He's a very good friend of. Shepherd. There's little Billy. It is. It's the big bull of the herd. In fact, let's go forward a little bit. The zebra herd just in front of us. Seems like they've all sort of come around. I will try and come and visit them again before we go. But I think. Of all the of all the locals that we get to know, there's been a small herd of zebra. They're all walking to the west, so we might not see them till later. Is that okay? That's the mare on the right. That's the mare that has had the scar on her neck. In fact, if you look just above little Billy right now, you'll actually see quite an anomaly in her neck. So I've got this little double chin thing going. Evil duck head, evil duck head. But then you might have to turn it up a bit more because it's deep in the sponge again. In fact, can't we just put it in the sponge? Maybe we could. And how does it sound? Better without the wind. But can you hear? I can hear. Okay. 
Shot a bully through there. Is that good? Okay, we'll move forward a bit. So, in case those of you haven't been around, or there's some of you that haven't been around for some time, you've only joined us of late. We've been here at Thornybush for about three months, and over those three months, uh, over those three months, we've gotten to know some individual animals, some creatures that, uh, no, we can't because of the sun. I just wanted to put them on. But, um, it's weird, we, we had these huge expectations of arriving here and, and, and getting to know leopard like we got to know leopard in the Sabi sand and getting to know the elephant and we thought that we'd have ample opportunity to watch Lion Pride for three months and all noble ideas but of course the universe and nature and the ways and that that, that the animals have been moving around thorny bush in the last three months has just meant that we've met with other little things that we never thought that we would and this little this little child is one of them this is a little wildebeest who was born probably not very long before we started film we started our last drive in fact I think when I got here it was barely a week old it was a brand new little wildebeest and I got here in May and that's like nearly five months probably even nearly six months late for a wildebeest birth so it, in, in my opinion it was unheard of and the odds were stacked against him based on the history of the calves before him I don't know, he's just kind of given off this persona that it's a little he, it's a little boy and his name is Billy, might be a little girl and she might also still just be Billy but just for argument's sake I'll refer to him her Herm, should I say Herm? Herm, yeah <laughs> it varies, the number of the adults in this herd the um, the females, there's the one big bull who we've just seen. In fact, he was the one that was with the impala. He's actually run back to join the herd. And we can only see Billy and his mom, and the other wildies are standing behind some of this acacia. And they, some of them are moving around. I can see one of the other three year olds moving, might actually move towards Billy. But I would say at least seven, six if not seven calves that were born in the summer lost their lives to leopard. I doubt lion, I don't think the lion were here. I, I don't think lion visit this part of the world very much at all. Um, I, I know that they have and we've filmed them here but it's, it's a case of they, they, they use it to get from A to B. This is not a place where lions hang around. And I suppose they can't because there are quite a lot of animals here. And if they just hung around here, animals would shout at them every day and they'd never get any hunting done. So it's not that lion kind of find places where the best hunting is. It's the places where are the best hunting, it's wiser to go there every now and then and hunt something. But if you stick around in the area, in the daily movement of the animals they'll find you and they'll shout at you and they'll shout at you till you get no peace and you can't hunt anymore so you have to move on and you'll find a place where it's peace and quiet where you can sleep and hunt 
the odd wanderer coming through the bush where there aren't a lot of other animals. That's why we find lion kills where there aren't that many other animals. The more eyes, the more ears, the more bodies, the more there is a chance of not being the one killed, but also the more chance there is of a predator being detected. So we do find game in concentration. For this little one to survive, it's been, well, I wouldn't say a miracle, but... We had a lot of protection from the rest of the herd and probably had a lot of life lessons more than the average little wildebeest. There's actually a lot of wildebeest, they're more than the average. I haven't looked at that again. I need to count. Because there are two groups standing in the trees here, and I think that might be there's another family that's going. So here there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven already. The nice little patch of shade. It's quite a hot day, by the way. It's hotter than most days have been, in fact. Not really far from a spring, early summer day. But there are at least seven in that herd under there, and I think that's a different herd because Billy's herd, which has got at least six adults standing in the shade, away from where Billy and his mom are, to the left. Which means that there are wildebeest here that haven't been here before. But it's not the time of day to see them because. It's hot. They want to be in the shade. They're not really worried about predators. They don't need, they don't need to worry about the proximity of stalking cats. Because it's just not in the cat's nature to go and waste energy by stalking at this time of day. Cats are all about energy. I think we can turn around and head across the river. We need to go and find elephants. I think they're in the river somewhere. Actually, you know what? We don't need to turn around. We'll just go up to the baobab, down the power line. And I'm going to go through that crossing where we lose signal because otherwise it's going to take us an hour to get around. Get the boys out. Dead on a 180 degree swivel. digging up rise on and boy was that making a bumpy something eating under the shade there 
sort of day, fear of Dacre. Be nice to just look at these trees with the data underneath them. This is an interesting this is an interesting concept here. Yeah. Three very interesting trees. With a pair of data, male and female. First of all, it's interesting that we've got both male and female together. At least I think it is, I haven't looked closely. Is the male. And there's you know, this is the two of them having a beautiful Friday afternoon in the shade. Can you see them? Yeah. And he's still behind the flamboyant. No, she is. He's the one that's walking to the left. She's dawdling. She's browsing. <laughs> He's impatient. Does it ring a bell, anybody? Okay, can we move on already? He turns around, starts to scratch his back. So the trees, the trees that are, the tree that's above them right now, with yellowish edges to it, and a grey hornbill flying on top. That's called a flamboyant. It's interesting how it's grown. Doesn't like the north wind, so it's protected itself against the north wind, and it's got the southeast of it caught up in a little bit of frost. You can see some of the yellow leaves that have been caught by a little bit of cold cold air. Nothing on the north that's really yellowed by the cold, but a pretty tree, but it's from South America, and it's going to be even prettier in summer with its flowers, also known as Delonix. D-E-L-O-N-I-X. Was it Y? Delonix. Could be with a Y. Then I'll check. And then there's a fig, and then there's a mahogany, the Natal mahogany, beautiful kushi called three trees of an old homestead. Okay, so we'll move on. Yeah. We want to go and cross the river and Talk to some elephants, and we want to get to a particular part of the eastern side of our area towards sunset to see if those little boy lions are going to stand up and start complaining about their lot in life. You broke up there. Can you repeat it, please?
Joanne. Hello, Joanne. You can't see me, but I can see you. No, only joking. Hi, Joanne. Joanne wants to know about secretary birds. Secretary birds. The thing with all the name changes <laughs> and political correctness and all sorts of things, you'd think that Secretary Bird would be one of the first ones to go. But it's six and they're still called Secretary Bird. Okay. But Joanne wants to know what part of Africa they found and what do they eat? So Anne will look in the book in a minute to see their southern limits. But I've seen secretary birds all the way up into Kenya, so I've known them throughout everywhere I've lived. I'm not too sure for how far south they are found. Um, I'm thinking, I wonder if we just, maybe we should just cross the river rather than go that way. No, really, I think that's going to be best. It's going to take us so long to get there to cross the river over here. We're going to, this way is like two minutes of no signal, I promise. Trust me. I know your mother said don't trust, don't trust the man that says trust me. But it'll be like just a couple of minutes we'll be off going through the river. Can you hear the antenna rattling? What is it? <laughs> yeah, it needed it. Needed it. We spent the three of us, Aaron, David, and myself. We spent the whole day on the digger. I know we're ending soon, but it's all, it's all you needed. Tightening up the things. So. Secretary birds require quite a specific habitat and that is linked to their diet. So it's a very good question because one can't be asked without the other. Um, they're one of those creatures that have specified or rather have found a niche that is so specific that there is very little that is that, that, that acts as competition. Ground hornbills are one because ground hornbills occupy the same niche or rather territory, uh, albeit maybe a slightly different niche. And yet they still feed on the same thing. So they are in competition for the same food source. And for secretary birds, as like as it is with ground hornbills, anything that moves is food. So they're like these miniature Tyrannosaurus Rex things that are the modern equivalent that walk around tall grasslands and if you move you're dead because secretary birds have these extended long legs coupled with a relatively long neck, a fatal beak, not even thinking of claws, they've got toes that are that are hammers. It doesn't even need claws, it's got these huge hammers that are toes that can stop the puff at it. Hardware failure. That's been restarted. Thanks, Aaron. So we're back. So what I was saying that secretary birds one of the main predators of baby tortoises, hatchling tortoises. I think solitudes run across the bar. Because um, in, in so many different places in Africa, and I've, I've had the, 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 the good fortune of living in an area there. They 
feed their chicks, but they, they break open a shell and they feed the feed them they fight, they don't eat them whole. But they are renowned for hunting like secretary birds or Some of the snake eagles, the feet and the legs of the secretary bird are cut in scales as opposed to legs down up to the knees.
be good now. Um, does that radio switch to any other channel? We need to head west, we need to head north and it takes us into the sun. We're not the only ones that suffer equipment failures. There appears to be an equipment failure amongst the lodges. They repeat on the mountain and stop working. 
which means that the game draft channel is dead. So it can't work without the repeats on the mountain. And that means that they have to rely on their alternative channel, which is channel 8. And being a VHF channel, not HF, but VHF, that's only good for short distances. Higher frequency, shorter the distance. Nature taught us this a long time ago. Elements communicate over long distance using low frequencies, and bats communicate with their world in, in very short distances using ultra high frequencies. So our radios are working on the same principle. The very high frequency VHF, very high frequency that we will operate on in the VHF radio. It's almost like line of sight. So unless you're next to a line of the Land Rover, it doesn't really work. However, it's weird that because we can see risk from most of the place out, when the repeat hooks, if you can see Marisco, the signal is repeated to every other vehicle, so that's why it works throughout the whole reserve. But right now, everybody can talk to each other. So we all run in blind. Run in blind. Friday afternoon. Oh look, there's a snake track. Oh, we missed the snake. Such a beautiful afternoon. That's got Aaron. Aronovich. Ha ha. Ohio. Hello Clancy. Reminding me that I was giving names and titles of reference books this morning. So, yes, quite right Clancy, let's carry on doing that. And the request from Clancy was plant books, tree books. We did the birds. It's going to be time to pack the books away soon. So while we're driving, looking for elephants, let's go to the next book in line. Hey, wait, here's a, here's a nice book for you to look at while I've got it out. It's called A Field Guide to the Tracks and Signs of Southern and East African Wildlife. It's by Chris and Tilda Stewart. It is published by Strake. Looking at the the emblem on the back, so I know my publisher emblem. This was twenty four thousand shillings when I bought it. Very expensive book. Twenty four thousand shillings. What I paid for this book. I can't remember when. I don't know why I didn't put my name in it. Normally I do that. Um, yes, it is Strike. Strike Publishers, which is actually a division of New Holland. And you'll actually find a lot of books if you go to www.strike. S T R U I K. Sierra Tango Romeo Uniform India Kilo. That's Sierra to find a lot of books that are very, very appropriate to our thingy. ISBN is 86872. Oh, there's a 1 before this. ISBN 1 86872 ISBN number. Very interesting book about tracks and signs and the feet of the animals and their they are done in all sorts of interesting information. If you ever come tracking for these animals. Mm. 
and in a minute I'll pull out another one. I can't remember this mammal book. It was a mammal book that I saw when I went up to visit Juan at, at Bushloads. I'll ask him when I see him next what the name of that mammal book is. The mammal book that I use, the mammal book that I find has got a lot of information, it's very helpful. It's called, this is by Jonathan Kingdon. In fact, anything that you find with Jonathan Kingdon. And if you happen to find the entire series of Kingdon's mammals, which are like 24 volumes of huge manuscripts, you can buy them for me for money. That's my wish list. The entire vol entire series of Jonathan Kingdon's mammals of the Southern Africa. Southern Africa. No, mammals. African mammals, not this is Southern Africa. This is African mammals. Gives you an idea of some of the mammals that are in other parts of Africa too. Uh, it is very East African centric, as it were. Jonathan Kingdon, K I N G D O N, not Kingdom with an M with an N, November, not Mike. And it's the Kingdon Field Guide to African Mammals. This edition is Academic Press, San Diego, London, Boston, New York, Sydney, Tokyo, and Toronto, Academic Press. And its main address is in London, copyright was 97. This looks like it was a, the first edition, by the way. But there's an exclusive African distributor. The so ISBN number 012. Four zero eight three double five dash two African mammals. Very informative. Mammal book, as I say, because I like it. And what it is is that each animal is on a page. But you see, unlike Jonathan, Jonathan Kingdon doesn't have photographs. He's got really wonderful drawings and line drawings and um, he's incredible with a pen or a pencil so I, I remember he came to visit us at our camp in Sulu one day in Tanzania because he's, oh, he's Kenyan he lives up there I think he's Kenyan but he was at our camp one day and he drew, he drew this most beautiful, just an ink, blue ballpoint ink of exactly what it looked like looking out over the swamp with all the elephants in front of camp. And we used to have 24 hours a day there were elephants out there. So for the few years that I lived in Sulu, every day I looked on elephants. As it happened in Tarangiri and to a large extent in Ruaha. Uh, well the universe has been kind to me to take me to places where there are elephants. Yeah, all the other animals are exciting and I love them to bits and I'm passionate about them. But I can't breathe without elephants. It's like the elephant's breath is my breath. If they don't breathe, I don't. That reminds me, actually, I brought a quote from Chief Seattle sent to me by Clancy, who's still waiting for me to read out and show you one of my tree books or plant books. But I'm hoping it's a good signal and I hope you can hear me because this was very, very poignant and this was very, very appropriate and it, I like it a lot. And uh, Chief Seattle, he said, all shink, all sha, okay, let me start again, take two, all sha, 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 Chief Seattle. All things share the same breath. The beast, the tree, the man. The air shares its spirit with all the life that it supports. And that's what we don't really keep track of.
thank you for that fancy, by the way. I might have driven over elephant tracks, but I don't think so. Um, so, we're getting to plant books. Yes, the earth shares breast. Long held belief. We breathe what nature gives us to breathe, and everything living in nature creates that very air, and we all share it. There is none amongst us that can claim to need more of that breath than any other. We have no more right to a breath of air than does an ant or an elephant. This is the case of say Piece of equipment fell in there, bent some pages. So I think I'll squeeze them tight. Yep, Van Dijk and Van Dijk, or as it must be pronounced, Van Dijk and Van Dijk. Van Dijk and Van Dijk, Van Dijk and Van Dijk. And you know what? They're not even rela relatives, they're not related. But there's Bram van Weyck and Piet van Weyck and they've both done tree books and they're both kind of dendrologists of note. What they have to say is good. So, this is the field guide to the trees of Southern Africa. And the sun's all wrong to show you now, but I'll show you in a minute. I'll read it. Two other features of it to you. It has wonderful keys. It has color coding with regards to different groups so that have managed to group the different trees into whether they're simple leaves or compound leaves or paraphernatic compound or pinnatic compound or whether they have thorns or spines or no thorns or no spines whether the leaves are alternate or whether the leaves are opposite and they've managed to color code that key into these different sections with all the different families and it's actually a very handy book um, because it's exactly what it says it's a field guide obviously it's a little trees so it's a bit heavy I mean we're talking about 540 pages worth. Um, published by Strike as well. As I say, Strike published a lot of But Strike Publishers, one of the one of the main publishers here in South Africa of natural history books. What's that is the dam. I can see some animals at the dam. Some impala. Impala ram. The buffalo, maybe the buffalo flying down further there, further around the dam. Back 
it's a, actually a very bright and hot day today. Probably around, not very hot, but it's, there's a nice warm berg wind coming in from the north that makes it probably about 25, 26 degrees for midwinter. Oh, there's a buffalo. The pilot seems to have moved on somewhere. Terrapin is diving into the water. Sorry boy, I didn't mean to startle you. You're the old man that had the damaged eye that time, I think. Looks like it. Yep, it's you. I can recognize you by your ear. At least I can see you opening your eye now. We saw him a few weeks ago. He had been bashed in the face and he had a bruised eye. His right eye was closed. They got very distinctive, sort of very tatty right ear. Quite a distinctive callus just in front of his hindquarters on his belly, where he's scratched over the years. Probably because it takes rubbed all the hair away. It's like his rump is almost bald as well. He's not a youngster. He's rubbed a lot of the hair off of his face, calluses around his eye and the base of his horn. He's an old man. And at this point, a bit of a standoff. At this point, I have to reverse across the damn wall because he's being stubborn. I could encourage him by starting the car. I suppose. Um, Mr. Buffalo. Excuse me, sir. Mr. Buffalo, we you get to move somewhere else? No, okay. Getting a clear message from him saying, I was here first, you move, so I'm going to move. Oh, what? You're getting a bit testy because I put my foot on the clutch. Well, prepare for this, dude. I've got to start the car.
Bye. See you later. Leave an animal as you find it. Try not to impact on its life. Oh, wait a second, dude. Take this one here. So we're next to you can find something. Grey animal. Grey animal. Oops, it might come this way. I guess not. Of course, without the radio working. Look, he's actually now coming. No, it's not. Facing this way again. He owns the damn wall. It's like, what's that, Little John? No. <laughs> what is the Robin Hood? Hmm? Yeah, Little John. Little John. And Robin Hood's story. You may not pass. Halt, night. Although there was, there was no, there was also that Monty Python skit. The black knight, the white knight, or silver knight, or whatever colour he was. His armour, I mean. He chopped off one arm. I can still fight you. He chopped off the other arm. I can kick you to death. Chopped off the leg. I can still kick you to death. Chopped off the other leg. Where are you going? Coward, I can still bite you to death. That was part of the... The, the Holy Grail on the party skip. Did you ever see that? No. Oh, uh, no, no, no. uh, you're too young. You'll learn. I'll learn. <laughs> or rather, you'll, you'll find it in it sometime. Keep it in mind, Monty Python, Holy Grail, hilarious, I make humour like that anymore. Oh, there's a mongoose, oh, there's a slender mongoose, mongobo. Yo. Patty? Patty who? So, but this is Patty who, that's a special Patty. Oh, okay. Paddy. the line. And then we've gone away. the other track. And then they must have gone down. Paddy was saying, the animal characters that I've gotten to know. It is kind of, but Paddy, it's also, it's been, it's only been two and a half, it's not even been three months, but I've got to know them. If I was seeing them every day, and I think I've got to know them, it's not like saying goodbye to Karula, who I'd lived with for, the, for those three and a half, three years odd. Um, a lot of these characters I've only got to know, and I saw them first tell them that I hardly develop a rapport with them. But yes, I, I, I will miss some of the interactions that I have, most certainly. But I think for me personally, 
I'm just glad to be getting back to the tip of body, going back to characters that I know back home. Um, and you, you don't stay long enough to get to know the locals. You get to meet a few of them and they're very nice. But you have to say goodbye. And They don't leave that indelible mark. Animals leave on the same place for a lot longer. So I think, in that sense, I'm a little bit grateful. In that sense, in the the free or rather frequent fighting, uh, sporadic fighting, some of these. I've never. I've never of the Black Dam. Becky has. Becky formed them. She went out to one. The other guy was in the for them. No, you oh. didn't. Aaron for them. Aaron, you for them, eh? But I've never missed them. I've never missed them. I've missed them for two and a half months. I've been desperate to see them. Um, I've missed the cubs and the, the lionesses that I lived with up in Ruaha for the three months last year more than I'll miss any animal here. But I developed, I, I, I spent so much time with spiders on the side of the world. I lost here. Almost the same length of time, actually. It wasn't quite three months. But in the same time, I... ...there than I ever did get, except for elephants. There in Rwanda, there some that I recognize over time. I've got lots of big rock families. It's my fault with the place where I drive. I was wondering is there a problem with seven, do you know? Now go ahead. Okay, copy text one. No radio. Funny, so you see, it's not only us. Tony Bush also. Has failures on Friday afternoons and weekends. <laughs> yeah. See, it's not a good thing or anything, it's just Africa. TIA, this is Africa. Yebo Aeronovich. Roger. Hi Roger, what happens if the vehicle breaks down on a game drive? Well Roger, give me a scenario. What's broken down? What is it that is broken down? What breakdown is it? We've already experienced a puncture. We've already experienced me running out of fuel. Once, only ever once in my entire life on drive live. Please just remember that. It's not something like I make a habit of it. It was once. Enough fuel here for another two drives. Um, I've had a 
I've just had a prop shaft almost fail on me on drive, but I didn't break down because I managed to fix it before it did. It's got a lot to do with preventive and maintenance, but you can't always prevent a mechanical breakdown. So, give me a scenario. What is what is it that has broken down? If it is, okay, I guess I can just answer that enough without having to go through the scenarios because if it is a mechanical failure that is beyond my ability to repair it temporarily using whatever I have on board the vehicle, it will require me calling somebody to come and tow the vehicle back to a place where I can fix it, which is invariably back to camp or the workshop at Royal Mother One. Wherever. It depends where we're doing our drive, but obviously it would mean making sure that whatever happens we get the vehicle back to a place where there are tools and there is a, there is a possibility of, of fixing it. So there are a number of things that I'm equipped to deal with if it breaks down on drive that are fixable on drive and then there are some other worst case scenarios where you've got serious mechanical failure where I have no choice. If it is such a mechanical failure that it prevents the vehicle being towed, then another matter entirely. But we're in a very small game reserve and not very far between places and with the radio and camps close by. I can either walk to camp or I could call somebody to come and fetch me to go and get tools, go and get a vehicle different story when in the middle of Africa and you're out in a remote place and you don't have radio contact and you don't have spares, that's a different story. We on the other hand are in a place where I wouldn't have to walk more than an hour, maybe, no, not even. Right now I'm close to maybe Well, I forgot modern technology, actually. Because in most places... You just have to go and find a signal. Uh, radio, I've got two-way radio, I've got a cell phone. Special hello to North Carolina. Tora in North, North Carolina. Why is it buzzing my ear? Tora, you, you, you flatter me. You really do. Um, sure. Uh, 
Um, Tora is saying that uh, we're just complimenting me on on I guess my spectrum of knowledge. Uh, I am proud of what I know. I am proud of <coughs> wanting to absorb as much as I can and just know as much as I can in the lifetime I have to live knowing that the more I learn the more there is to learn and knowing that I'll never learn even a fraction of what there is out there but it's all relative I know a lot about this I know very little about subjects that you know about Torah city and city living and things that are part of your life so it is relative but thank you for I accept the compliment and I'm humbled by it but I don't really have much in the way of formal this I'm I'm self-taught, I'm self-read, I am a child of nature that has understood a, a, a connection or a, I've had a fascination with it and an understanding and a I don't know what, how to put it but I've been able to read it and able to learn from it my entire life and there aren't any books things that can teach you these what nature has offered their books that can guide you quite appropriately called guidebooks um, not because they're books for guides they guidebooks because they guide you to the right answers and sometimes there's a lot of self exploration and a lot of self interpretation and they come through being able to observe things and, and, and interpret what it is that you're observing and deduce or deduction make make or understand what you're observing. It is a yeah. be yesterday. I finished high school, I didn't go to university, I went to the arm, I was conscripted for two years after high school, I was, I started doing my basic training at the age of 17, before my 18th birthday I was doing, I was, uh, mustered, what we call it in the Navy, I was mustered to the Marine Corps and I started my Marine training before my even 18th birthday. I, so I was a Marine and we went up to the Namibia-Angola border which was South West Africa at the time and there were Russian and Cuban forces that were supposedly our enemies and we had a war going and even then nature was my thing Okay, excuse me, I've got to, I've got to chat to somebody. Oh, there's Willoughby. Going down to the damn drink, I think we'll go down there too. Hey Rob. How are you, Paul? Very good, thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. No, no, but I also, what, uh, Channel 7 down? No, I thought, because also Channel 8, we have to be close to here. Where was that in Globe last time this morning? Okay. Okay. Well, I have. I've, I've, I did. Spenny, I came up past Waxfield. There's no corns going west from there. 
So we're going to come down here and then go back around maybe uh, Nanzan back to the cut line. It is. But it's also such a lovely day. This is winter in Africa. Welcome. <laughs> okay. Famba Gui. Okay. Come back, guys. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Yummy. Cool. And when they're gone, I want to start up the camera. Go down. There are some wildebeest here. Let them go past the dam. I also want to go past the dam. <sighs> so, what was I saying? Yeah. Anyways, after that, I didn't have. I didn't go to university or anything. I did. When I first started working in the bush, I did game ranger training courses. I did a. I did a beginners rangers course, and then. Then she did an advanced rangers course, um, and that's how it was. There were strange ways that I got into this whole guiding thing, but it was in days when there wasn't really a need for guides, and that all you needed was just a passion and a, and a knowledge of it, and you could get a job as a guide. But now, of course, it's completely different. Now there's so many lodges, and it's, it's so restricted and controlled. But over the years, I helped out training guide. I've done a lot of guide training myself in all the countries that I've lived. I've trained guides and been part of guide training and trying to get guides to to operate in the bush in ways that are, are in harmony and, and, and not intrusive. And there's some guides that have come a long way over the last 20 something years who were guides that I started out with or I gave opportunities to or um, I had on training courses. In fact, there's a guide here, Charles uh, Patrick's brother, Charles Gomeni. He's one of them. Charles is here. Charles, I hired was his first job, in fact, as a guide when I hired him a long time ago. Michelle, a copy. Let's call it a copy. Madonna. No, no, no. Uh, what can I say? A carpy. Michelle was asking, have I ever spent any time with a carpy? No. I've never been to West Africa. They only occur in West Africa. They're the only living relatives of giraffe. I wish I could see one day. One of those animals that live in Africa that I would really like to see one day. And I've never seen one. But I've spent, because I've never been to West Africa. Thanks, Robert. Oh, that's Mildred. <laughs> I 
I put a spanner in the works. Mulgrew's up by the water. Right next to it. Oh, there's a buffalo too. There's Mulgrew. Cross my hat. And a bus coming down. Fast asleep. Smile on candid camera. So I've had training that is far better than any formal training or academic training. I've been trained by the best. I've been trained by the very animals and by nature itself. See, rather than another human's interpretation of it, I've been trained by nature to make my own interpretation and deduction. There's a big buff walking across there. Mulder is not even bothered. Yeah. Should I go and pull a tail? No. No. Okay. <laughs> Should I go and pose with her? Yeah, posing Sort of go and kneel down next to her. And put my sunglasses on her face. Oh yeah. Good land over the same tires as my tires, my land is. Come on, Robert, move on already. Should I stop and start? I think they have. Yeah, we saw the crocodile, thank you very much, people. I'm going to try something now for the sake of
camera work? Uh, did I start it again? Yeah, you did. I had it one. Okay, so what I can do, I'm not driving into the sun anymore. Put my other eyes on. Goodbye, girl. It's really amazing to get so close to a crocodile. Yeah. It's taken us a few months, but we got there. Elephants, yeah.
the boys. radio working. They say it'll be fixed tomorrow. Somebody's probably got to go up in the red scope and fix it. Okay. See the last drive, people might be going away this, for the weekend. Um, what can I say? I don't know what to say. 
yeah, and this is sad. The last drive on Sunday. Um, Casper and Rosie asked if we could maybe have last drive Monday morning for the American viewers. Look, basically for us, we have to we, we have to deal with staff issues and other issues. So it kind of could be hard. I don't know. I could just we are happy to talk about it, but. Fabian, I want elephants too. We're looking for their tracks. So we're going to go back to. We're on Central. We'll go back to Nanzan. We'll go down Mangwa Road. We're going to sort of do a couple of loops and see if we can find them. Of course, the setback this afternoon is that there is no radio contact with the rest of the world. Unless we're really close, like I was with Robert shortly that long one day. But these eddies are here somewhere, and I'm trying my best to find them for sunset. All good. Yeah? Okay, so while David's trying to sort that out, another book that you can look at. Or no, look at a series of books. They're known as because they're from all over South Africa. They're actually uh, the South African Wildflower Guide. And they're a series of wildflower guides published by the Botanical Society of South Africa. Look for those. This is such an old copy. This one is a, this is this is with 16 rand 50 when I bought it in like in the 80s. 16 rand 50. Nowadays it's like 10 times as much. But any of the wildflower guides that are published by the Botanical Society of South Africa for whatever region it is that you want to visit South Africa to see the, uh, the, the expanse of the floral kingdom in those specific areas. They have collected several biomes, including the Cape, KwaZulu Natal, this is Transvaal Lowfelt and Escarpment, including the Kruger National Park. That's the book for this region. And is it okay now? No. No. You want more time with it? No, it's only the soldering iron. Uh, the one that Aaron did? No, no, it's not. It's uh, a different one now. No, it's from the power source. The oh, but that's probably because I was fiddling with things today. No, I wasn't that. Oh, so it's not that. 
Chaz a newly pushed tree over the road. Could be we're getting closer to elephants. There's only one vehicle left been squeezing past. Take care. busy game reserve up in North with multiple sightings. And Aaron was trying to get me, but what's that Aaron? Hello Donna. Regarding that buffalo that we saw, because I said he was an old buffalo. Don't know what to, how old can they get? Well, I think around 30, 35. Somewhere around there. So with an old buffalo, you can see just the, the size and shape of his horns, the size of his butt, the calluses around his eyes and the shape of his ears. calluses and the inner thighs, there's just so many things that uh, you don't have to know age, in fact it's physically impossible to know how many years it is, but you can just see the wear and tear in an animal that has been around for decades with an old bull buffalo in so many, many aspects of his, his, his persona, his physical And I, 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 I can't see, I was too excited, I shouted, it's only major, and then he ran away. Okay, we'll try and, we'll go up, we'll go back into the drainage line over here and see if we can find it again, but, I don't know, chances are slip.
case you didn't know, in case you didn't get that because we lost signal, we just had a brief, not even two second glimpse of a honeybird here. Down here in the drainage line, we're going to see if we can maybe cross paths with it again, because it kind of ran up this way. So unusual to see a honey badger this time of day. Not the first time, I've seen a number of occasions. It just seems today is an incredible day when it sounds like the radio's down, but there's just so many animals out doing their thing. Um, and it just happens to be that the radio's down. Day when the weirdest thing is that up in the north the channel six is working. So I got an update on that channel from what's happening down here. Nothing much happening down here, but boy, we were in the northern part of Thornybush right now. We certainly have a choice of animals to go and view. down there and this truck going to be showing itself. The honey badger is going to hide. What you got there? Jonathan Kingdon book. I don't know, 20 something, I think. So there's one for every family of mammals. There's one volume that's like this huge book that's just for the rodents. There's one volume for the ant. No, there's I think two or three volumes for the antelope. There's one volume for the cats. There's one dog for the canids. One volume for the. Did I say one dog? Yeah, one dog. One dog for the canids. And one volume for the canids. There's one volume for, for the elephant. There's one volume for every type of mammal. It's, it's short. I've only ever seen one set of that, and it's owned by Richard Bonham from the Tudor Hills in South East Kenya. In the, in the beautiful view. Kilimanjaro, just near Amboseli National Park, and I wasn't there long enough to enjoy even 
opening one or two of those volumes, I just managed to touch them on his bookshelf. And for a, a bookworm like me, that was an honor. Did you have it on camera? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> because we came around and of course it came up again, and it was so this time I'm sorry I'm going up a bit, but it African uh, get station be cross with me if they want to. Of course, in the noise now, we're probably scared away, but he's been digging for something here, this honey badger. I can see that with people. I'm talking, I'm not even in the rain. Good help with the rain. See if we can here. Okay, so honey badger is digging for something. I think. Let's try once more. So get ready this time. Third time lucky, you're right. Oh, that was hard. That has never, ever, 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 ever happened before, ever. Here I was, coming around for a second pass, thinking, oh, of course the honey bed is not going to be there. And as we got into the bottom, there was nothing. But then all of a sudden, it's there. The same honey bed. And I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're just going to stop here, briefly. I'm going to listen for elephants. Let honey badger go back to digging, and we're going to try this a third time. I don't know, Alan, if you're watching, how many years you've been asking? Okay, sorry. Now. Again, huh? no, 
fix this. Aaron's saying, could it, that's probably the lion that probably come through the riverbed. I think with time we went back to camp. Closer to camp. We're gonna let's do that. Go past Honey Badger if he's there, he's there. Okay. Aaron's saying that there's something happening around camp. In fact, heading down towards the riverbed to stop us from camp. So it'd be worthwhile to not. We'll go down Mungo Road. Sorry, Flex, Liz, and me, myself, I am so early today. going behind the ridge. No. If we go higher up, we might see it better. Okay, we're far from camp, but here in saying that the canoe and animals are alarming. <laughs> tracks were heading down that way this morning. And then they, dis they disappeared, they left the road. And they've probably been sleeping all the day in the bush. Now they might be crossing the river somewhere. Any station near BMX corner?
Look at that. Flowers for my lady. Sunset on this Friday afternoon. The most beautiful blossom of the spring. This is the first one that is blossomed. I found a branch that was still full of leaves yesterday that was broken by elephants. This is Dombea rotundifolia. This is the wild pear blossom. It's not a pear. It doesn't have a fruit like a pear. It doesn't have anything that really resembles it to the pear commercial fruit family other than, I guess, it's blossom. Maybe, I don't know. Really beautiful. The wild pear. From there. Got the old dried leaves there, broken twigs. But interesting that some of the flowers, or rather some of the wild pear, is still in leaf. And here's the first one we found in, uh, in, in flower. I don't know how close you can get it. And then on macro or what? Yeah. What's this one flower or a whole bunch of them? Like that top right bit of the tree. Okay, let's just continue. Actually, let's also see the mountain part of the mountain. Not hearing any. Flower already for a couple of days. I must have missed it. We had a mugger ruffle. I just missed it. One of the first two wild pairs in town that I'm glad we caught it.
could do in the road. Coming towards us. Wanna listen? I mean, we must have missed them. They came up from here. They've gone east. We have to try and find them tomorrow. We were too far west. I was told they were going west. Plus, some of them went On a normal summer's day, if you have a shady patio with a nice cement and a low light under the patio on a nice warm day, kind of flat. Thank you. 
if we let you send innocent people, we say goodbye. In fact, I came down and Find a river load down. I didn't go straight to the river where I was. I think there might be better. That's a starting point tomorrow morning. Sorry for some of you. Hoping maybe some of you who are on the weekend. Having a fun weekend somewhere, so that was a fabulous time. Yeah, fabulous. Oh. Who knows, they might have even crossed the river. Oh boy. Okay, well, goodbye, everybody. Bye.